introduction. Th thank you very much. Um, okay. Yeah, so I started to be recorded now. Um, again, uh, thank you very much for uh, the, the, the introduction and um, the, the kind words also that you use for, uh, for introducing me. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit late here. So um, if I do some mistakes, you, you will forgive me, I hope. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, uh, some recent work uh, that I've been doing on um, um, the definition of frequency in power systems and the electric circuits. And um, some uh, um, geometrical interpretation of these uh, uh, quantities in, in, um, um, that, that, that can be useful for um, uh, the modeling and the control of the power system itself. Um, so I will uh, split the presentation into two sections. One is um, uh, a geometrical approach and uh, this is a geometrical interpretation. Uh, I will show many equations, but uh, I, I will try to, to keep it um, as graphical uh, and intuitive as possible. And then uh, in the second part, I will try to use these uh, definitions and interpretation to do something useful for uh, uh, power system analysis. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, something that is completely or apparently completely unrelated to, to power systems, uh, which is um, the definition of a trajectory in space. Um, in theory, uh, we could use uh, any dimension, also multidimensional spaces, uh, but uh, it's easier to show trajectories in um, uh, two dimensions. Uh, so for um, the, um, the description of the, the quantities and the definition of the quantities, we'll use uh, plane curves. So let's say that we have this trajectory and uh, the point P is moving in time and we can describe the uh, position of point P with this um, vector in an appropriate set of coordinates. And then uh, the derivative, the time derivative of this uh, vector is simply the derivative of each of its components. Um, that said, uh, we can define uh, and it's important in geometry to define uh, invariance. Okay, so one of the first invariants that one finds is um, um, the arc length. Now, invariants are defined as quantities that do not change if the uh, coordinates are changed. And uh, the arc length is, in fact, the, defined as um, this quantity. Okay, so we need to calculate the uh, speed uh, or rate of change of position of this. Uh, uh, point P and then uh, doing uh, um, we need to calculate in the integral of that in time. So I will use um, this quantity um, as part of uh, the next uh, definitions. And also later on, uh, I'm going to use uh, this angle theta uh, because um, plays an important role in the definition of the curvature, which is a quantity that we use a lot. Okay, um, so once we define a set of local coordinates for the point, so let's say that we follow the point P moving along this trajectory and um, we define some set of coordinates, um, we can always define a special coordinates for it. And these uh, are, one is the tangent, uh, that is simply the normalized vector of the velocity of this uh, uh, position. And um, just for um, uh, clarity, uh, I will use the, a dot on top of the quantities to define derivative with respect to the arc length position and uh, um, the prime to define the derivative with respect to time. Um, another coordinates that is um, normal to uh, the tangent uh, is in fact called normal and um, is uh, the second derivative normalized with respect to the arc length. And then uh, the last coordinate is the binormal and is the vector product of the normal and the tangent. Now, uh, for the first time here appears a quantity that is called K that, um, or kappa, better. It's uh, in fact a, a Greek letter here, um, which is the curvature, okay? And um, uh, I will uh, restrict uh, the, 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 all the definition and the discussion to maximum three dimensions, uh, even later in the, in the presentation. But in fact, we could, um, of course, for uh, any, and dimensional space define as many coordinates as we need to define any point in the space. But uh, the classical um, um, discussion of uh, differential geometry limits to three dimensions because that is the dimension of um, the space that um, we usually know. Then it was expanded to four dimension for the space time of uh, relativity, but in theory, it can be expanded to uh, any dimension. 
Okay, so we have these two coordinates, n and t, in a, a plane curve that is no by we can calculate it by normal, but um, uh, our curve will not um, uh, go out from the, the plane, so uh, there won't be any actual component on the binormal. And uh, the curvature is uh, uh, another invariant of this uh, um, uh, trajectory. And um, uh, it's defined as uh, the uh, derivative of uh, this angle theta that I indicated before with respect to the arc length, or as um, a uh, vector product here uh, of the velocity by the acceleration. And then uh, there is this um, division by the cube of uh, the magnitude of the velocity, which um, is needed for uh, uh, making the unit of the curvature right. Um, now, k is another invariant because it does not depend on the coordinates that we use. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, would be a relevant uh, part of the discussion that I'm going to do regarding the frequency. Um, now, um, another property that we can show, unfortunately, I'm sorry that I'm going to uh, discuss at the beginning of this presentation many equations, many definitions, but uh, they are functional to what I'm going to use later on uh, when I'm going to talk about power systems and control. Um, so um, if we uh, calculate the second derivative of the uh, position of the trajectory, so the, the acceleration at the end, uh, we can find an expression like the one that uh, I am uh, indicating now, which is um, a function of um, quantity rho uh, that is um, um, a sort of um, uh, radial frequency, radial uh, rate of change uh, of the uh, quantity uh, of the trajectory and uh, an angular rate of change of the trajectory, which is called omega later on. And I'm calling it omega on purpose because uh, it's um, related uh, very much to the angular frequency of uh, uh, the lattical quantities, uh, as we know. Um, now, as you see, these two quantities as a similar definition. One is defined using a, a scalar product. The other one is defined as a, a vector product. And omega, in fact, here is um, a, a vector of the same order of um, x. Um, but um, in, in a, its magnitude is related to the curvature. Okay? So uh, if we calculate the magnitude of omega and um, the, the speed, then uh, uh, their product is in fact uh, the curvature. And so it's an invariant as well of our uh, um, trajectory. So in the following, we call uh, rho as radial frequency and uh, omega as uh, magnitude uh, will be the azimuthal frequency of the system, which um, if we remember this um, definition of normal and tangent of the curve, uh, then uh, they uh, take this meaning basically. So the radial uh, frequency is proportional to this um, x dot in the same direction of uh, uh, the normal. So is the variation of uh, the trajectory um, having an observer on top of the, the curve that is uh, just uh, in front of it instead of the azimuthal frequency is the uh, rate of change of the curve uh, tangent to us. Okay, um, in, in, in reality for um, uh, n dimensions, we can define um, um, n invariants, okay? So the third invariant in three dimension uh, is called torsion, okay? And uh, it has a definition that uh, involves um, the derivative of the acceleration, this omega that we have already seen, and then uh, again, uh, the curvature. And again, uh, this is a an invariant uh, that does not depend on the coordinates, but happens only if our motion has uh, some uh, ripple in uh, uh, the third dimension, in this um, uh, direction of the binormal, in fact. And uh, if we multiply tau by the magnitude of the speed, we have um, a quantity that has the units of a frequency, and we, we can call it a torsional frequency. OK, now um, the questions that I put here are um, uh, well known in differential geometry. Um, they express um, uh, a set of differential equations that link the normal, the tangent, and the binormal vectors, which are this set of coordinates that define the position, the local um, variation of position of this um, uh, point on the trajectory to the derivatives 
of uh, the tangent and normal by normal vectors. Now, this is um, equations are um, called the Fresnel-Ray formulas in differential geometry, and um, um, we cannot think of them as a generalization of uh, the part transform of uh, our system. Okay? Um, but in fact, they express the fact that um, the azimuthal frequency and this uh, torsional frequency um, gives um, the fact of the variation in time of uh, the coordinates of the of the points that uh, varies uh, on the trajectory. Okay, so so far we have not mentioned anything about electrical power systems and no electrical quantity whatsoever. So it seems that I'm just uh, discussing something completely uncorrelated. Um, now the point is um, that uh, we can find uh, a, um, um, an analogy between electrical quantities and um, uh, the quantities that have been discussed so far. Um, now the trick here is uh, that uh, we need to think of uh, the trajectory X as um, um, a generalized trajectory. So. Uh, let's say that uh, this is in fact uh, um, equivalent to the coordinates of uh, a magnetic flux. Now, it's not really a magnetic flux as we typically study in electrical machines, that is the flux that is flowing to some uh, magnetic uh, circuit or in an iron core of an electrical machine, but it is in fact um, a flux that we have uh, um, in, as a vector in, in space, okay? Now, we know that from the Faraday's law that the derivative of it is the voltage. And uh, okay, there is a minus for uh, the length law, but um, is a material in this discussion. In fact, I'm not going to use the flux any, anywhere uh, because all the equations that we have seen in uh, the previous slides, uh, um, interestingly, uh, never really use uh, X per C, but uh, some time derivative of it. And the minimum is the first time derivative, which for me is now the velocity and uh, the analogous to a voltage or, or, or the uh, electric potential in, in a point of the circuit. Okay, so with this uh, uh, in mind, um, we can rewrite the equations of uh, this radial, azimuthal, and uh, torsional frequency that we have discussed uh, in terms of the voltage. So we have uh, um, this definition. As you see, we have voltage or the first derivative or the second derivative of the voltage, but never really the expression of the flux, which would be a problem because in electric circuit, we never really calculate or measure or use the flux and, and magnetic flux uh, anywhere. But um, um, all the invariance that we have defined depends in fact only on the, on the voltage or the time derivative of it. Um, and okay, these are just definitions and uh, they might not look particularly useful at this point. Um, unless uh, we find that uh, these quantities uh, have actually some relation with um, uh, electrical quantities that uh, we can actually use uh, and uh, we know. Okay, so let's do some examples and uh, see how rho, omega, and psi do actually have um, potentially a meaning for um, the circuits, okay? And um, um, the actual typical quantities that we use, like for example, angular frequency, of um, a voltage. Okay, so the simplest possible case is stationary single phase voltage, which um, uh, I, I need to express not in the usual way in uh, terms of um, uh, complex uh, numbers or phasors as we are used to do in uh, um, circuit theory, uh, but as a vector. Okay, so um, this is a little uh, difference that I need to use because otherwise I cannot uh, uh, reutilize all the definitions and uh, the, the expressions that uh, I've been defined so far. But um, at the end of the day, phasors are vectors. Now, these are at the end of the day, the equivalent as the magnitude of complex numbers and the product of complex numbers. So um, we, we are going to have basically the same rules just using this uh, inner and outer products uh, that is defined for vectors. Um, so I, I'm going to express this voltage as which is a single phase voltage as the two components uh, magnitude and uh, um, uh, defined by the angle and the phase angle of the, uh, the, the sine wave that defines this, uh, this voltage and uh, I'm calling it uh, as the components 
in, in a plane. Um, so V1 and V2. Then if I do that, then uh, um, I can calculate rho, omega, and psi. And in the uh, stationary condition where uh, omega zero is constant and V is constant, then I obtain directly that rho is zero, uh, as expected. There is no variation of the magnitude, so it's okay. Then psi is zero, that is expected as well because um, uh, this voltage is a plane curve, so it cannot have torsion at all. But omega, which is this uh, azimuthal, azimuthal frequency that I define, is in fact my system. Okay, th this was more or less to be expected. If I plot the um, uh, in the plane uh, that I've defined in the coordinates that I defined the uh, uh, stationary uh, a single phase voltage is in fact a circle, and we know that the circle has a constant curvature. In fact, it has a constant radius, and the curvature uh, is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, omega zero divided by the radius. And in our definition, then uh, the azimuthal frequency is omega zero. Okay, let's see what happens in uh, three phases. Uh, that uh, is a more common case for power systems, and uh, certainly um, uh, less obvious. Um, it's less obvious the results that we are going to take. But let's consider again just the constant. Uh, stationary conditions, so constant omega, zero, constant magnitude, and we want a system that is balanced at the beginning. Uh, we just focus on the simplest case. Um, in this case, we will have three components and uh, one per phase, for example. Again, if uh, what we are going to calculate uh, are um, invariants, then uh, it doesn't really matter what coordinates we use as long as they are uh, linearly independent. Okay, so again, we calculate uh, according to the definition that we have uh, found so far. And uh, we find that again, rho is zero because uh, as, as expected, because the magnitude is constant. Omega, even in this case, apart from the fact that expression is a little bit more complicated, but we obtain again, omega zero. So is again, what we expected and what we wanted for this case. So the azimuthal frequency is the angular frequency of our system. And then psi is null. Now, this means that the curve, even if is in three in a space that uh, has three dimension, is actually plane on a plane. Now, this plane uh, is not uh, one of um, the planes described by the coordinates, but still a plane. So you see a plot in, uh, in uh, the space uh, of, with coordinate uh, A, B, C, then uh, our curve is going to be a circle again. We know that because the curvature is constant. Uh, and uh, um, is, is just, uh, uh, again, uh, the stationary regular circle. OK. Um, what happens when we have uh, unbalances? Uh, th this can be more interesting because we should start to see um, some variations of the quantities and uh, possibly some time dependence of um, um, maybe the curvature or um, the radial frequency. Um, okay, so unbalances uh, transform this circle into possibly a, a, an ellipse. And uh, so now the ellipse um, is uh, again a nice geometrical figure, but it doesn't have constant curvature. So we need to expect that um, omega now, the zimuta frequency is going to change. And uh, this is in fact what we see. So we see that the radial frequency is not uh, zero all the time whenever there is uh, an unbalance. So then uh, horizontal uh, constant lines are uh, the balance cases that are compared to the, these two cases where there are unbalances in the magnitude or unbalances in the phases. Um, now, this results in this probably a little bit more interpretation. And uh, the problem here is that um, each of the phases has, in fact, um, constant frequency. Um, the point is that when we take them as a curve on, in a space uh, ABC, then uh, uh, the azimuthal frequency here is not what we actually expect, which would be omega zero, but uh, the curvature of this ellipse that we see in this, in this uh, ABC space. Um, now, is this correct? Well, um, the point is that uh, the problem here is that we have not just uh, one uh, uh, single uh, um, uh, symmetrical component. We don't have only the positive components, but uh, whenever there is an imbalance, we have also some negative components. So. Um, it's natural that um, the instantaneous frequency of the signal 
changes in time, even if the components that perceive of the signal that are the positive and negative components have constant frequency. So this is, at the end of the day, the well-known paradox between instantaneous frequency and uh, the Fourier frequencies that we can uh, calculate uh, looking at uh, the harmonic content of the, of the signal. Now, I'm not going to discuss that, but it's consistent. It's just uh, that we need to remove the negative frequencies before um, calculating the instantaneous one if we want results that are, are uh, uh, consistent with what we expect them to be. Um, and this complicates even more if we use uh, harmonics uh, or uh, unbalanced harmonics, in fact. So harmonics leads to ripple on top of the um, uh, ellipse or a, a circle that we have seen so far. And uh, they, for the first time, leads to um, torsion, uh, non-null torsion or non-null torsional frequency. Um, so again, uh, whenever we have these harmonics, uh, we have a non-null radial frequency, a strange behavior, if you like, of uh, the uh, azimuthal frequency, which is, again, a sort of causing uh, or a, a more general definition of instantaneous frequency, as we know from um, time frequency analysis, for example, signal processing. And then this uh, third uh, uh, component uh, that is this third invariant, really, the, the torsional component that um, appears at this point because of the harmonics. OK, um, when we have time varying quantities, like time varying magnitudes or even time varying uh, phase angles, um, then we have a, a very strange behavior. So here I am just uh, putting two examples. Uh, the um, uh, black line is uh, the balance case, uh, just for reference. And then um, uh, in the left uh, plot, uh, there is a system with, which um, has um, a, a time varying uh, magnitude of the um, uh, three phases with some uh, function in time. Um, it was, uh, I think, a periodic function in time. So um, sooner or later, the curve repeats itself. And uh, on the left, there is a variation of phase angles. So phase angles, instead of being um, 0 and minus 120 and plus 120, they change periodically in time. And this leads to very complicated behavior and uh, uh, strange uh, shapes of um, radial, azimuthal, uh, and uh, torsional frequency. Now, these are defined as invariants, so they are conceptually right, assuming that we accept that uh, the uh, uh, coordinates are A, B, C, and uh, uh, that, that is the, the trajectory, that is the Kaibel de voltage, is in fact the trajectory of the speed of our flux. Um, we need to filter these uh, harmonics and these uh, um, components, uh, especially the, the invariant harmonics, uh, if we want to have something that resembles the instantaneous frequency that we would like to see. OK, so um, let's see if uh, these definitions have um, um, any um, um, are useful when uh, we study the dynamic of a power system. Now, in a power system, especially high voltage transmission systems, we need to expect that um, um, harmonics are very small, if any, um, because they have to be filtered anyway uh, for network codes. And then uh, that um, uh, negative sequences and uh, zero sequences are also filtered as much as possible. So we need to expect that the system is pretty much balanced. It might not be um, stationary because of the transient following, for example, a short circuit or um, any contingency that happens in the system. So. Uh, at this point, um, we can show what happens to the quantities that uh, I've been defined. And um, this would be the trajectory of the voltage at the bus of the network after a three-phase circuit. Now, there are two distinct uh, regions, let's say, of this curve. The, the initial one is, planar, uh, is, is a plane uh, circle because the system is assumed to be perfectly balanced and symmetrical. Uh, at the beginning of the simulation. And then uh, there is a short circuit that is this uh, AUR here. And then after the contingency, the system gets back to another uh, stationary conditions, which is not exactly the same. So it's not exactly the same plane, but still gets back to uh, a circle again. 
Now, this looking at the time um, domain simulation of the voltages would look like this. Uh, but then if you calculate the radial, azimuthal, and torsional frequencies, we pretty much get what we would expect. So the radial frequency has uh, some issue during the fault, but then um, as soon as the magnitudes are kept constant or gets back to be constant, that it, it goes to zero. There is no negative sequence or harmonic, so there is no variation or rho in stationary conditions. Um, then uh, the omega resembles very close. Now, this curve is um, um, compared to the estimation of um, the frequency through a PLL. So the PLL would estimate uh, what we uh, consider to be the instantaneous frequency of the, of the bus. And um, they pretty much uh, coincide in the, in, in, during the simulation, basically because we have removed all the sources of um, the strange behaviors that we've seen in the previous examples. And then the torsional frequency is clearly non-zero during the fault because it's um, a particular condition, but then it goes quickly to zero after that. So uh, at the end, we can say that under certain assumptions, uh, the asymptotal frequency, which is this curvature that we are defining on, of, uh, um, using differential geometry definitions, is our angular frequency and is what we would like to uh, uh, measure and estimate during a transient on a power system. Okay. Um, so we have that this interpretation can be useful um, given some conditions. Um, so let's put ourselves in these conditions, which are the ones where the um, uh, inter geometric interpretation makes sense for us. Um, and um, let's consider then. Um, um, also to transform the vector of the voltage using uh, some uh, well-known transformation. The, the, the part transformation is the one that I'm going to use here. We could use also Clark transform, um, which uh, would give exactly the same results. Um, now, in this case, uh, assuming that uh, there is no zero sequence, uh, I'm also assuming implicitly that there is no negative sequence, then I, I can define a vector that is uh, of the voltage um, in this way. Of course, in this case, the coordinates are also a um, function of time because of um, uh, the definition of the park transform. But this can be easily taken into account when I, I calculate the derivative because I will have the derivative of the coordinates depends on the angular uh, frequency with which the park coordinates are rotating. Um, so ultimately, I can define uh, all my quantities that I've defined so far using dq axis. The zero axis is null and um, is not um, uh, meaningful or relevant in, in our calculations uh, at this point, so we'll neglect it. And um, I can define again my rod, the vector of uh, um, this um, uh, omega that, whose magnitude is in fact uh, the azimuthal frequency that I define. There is always this omega zero, which is um, at the end uh, the uh, angular speed of the park transformer, but then this component here on the left, on the right is the variation of the frequency of my signal or my voltage uh, in time um, with respect to omega zero. And uh, this is in fact the definition of instantaneous frequency that we have in signal processing, for example. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, it, it could be maybe if uh, some of you was uh, experiencing signal processing, it could be inter uh, interesting to define um, this quantity, which is um, also called sometimes the park vector, um, which is um, a complex number that is uh, composed of uh, the, um, the real part is the D um, axis component of the voltage and the, the imaginary part is the Q axis component. Now, if you look at this quantity and uh, you imagine that there is no negative sequence, then uh, this is in fact an uh, um, analytic signal. Okay, and uh, by definition, uh, the instantaneous frequency of an analytic signal that is defined in uh, signal processes is this expression. Uh, now, interestingly, analytic signals are defined taking a signal and then the Hilbert transform of the signal, that is an imaginary part. And that is a problem because the, uh, the Hilbert transform is calculated. Um, um, as an integral 
from minus uh, from the time that it goes from, from an infinity to plus infinity, which means that we need to know the whole signal uh, for um, all time to calculate the instantaneous fragment, which is a sort of inconsistency. But if we look at the same problem through the um, differential geometry point of view, the instantaneous frequency depends exclusively on uh, a, a local and instantaneous property of the trajectory at uh, every single time. So it's more consistent in this way, even though the results uh, analytically and the expression of uh, the instantaneous frequency in the two cases is exactly the same. Okay, um, of course we can define also this uh, radial frequency and um, um, Interestingly, uh, probably this is one of the, uh, I think, most um, relevant part of the uh, of what I'm going to say. Um, let's define this additional quantity. Okay, this uh, u as uh, the logarithm of uh, the magnitude of the voltage. Now, if we do that, then uh, we can in fact come out with uh, a definition of the frequency that is uh, a sort of complex quantity. Okay, so looking at the uh, Park vector here, then uh, we can say, okay, I define um, another complex quantity that is u plus j theta. The derivative of it is, at the end of the story, what I have defined as the radial plus uh, j, the azimuthal frequency of my of my signal itself. Now, this is what I'm going to call complex frequency, but is de facto simply a special case of um, the uh, geometrical frequency or the geometrical interpretation of the uh, curvature of uh, a trajectory that I've discussed so far. Um, now, this um, a way of uh, um, expressing the frequency as a complex number as a relevant uh, um, byproduct, and that is that if V is my analytic signal, then uh, the time derivative of V is in fact eta by V. Okay. And this is the expression that I'm going to use and the property that I'm going to use when I'm going to define the link with the, the power flows and the, the power injections uh, in, in a grid. Okay, um, now of course uh, um, we can define, uh, um, we, can, uh, we can see that this eta here is nothing else that, uh, than a special case of the time derivative that I've uh, discussed at the beginning of the presentation where there was this rho plus uh, this omega with uh, the vector product. Uh, now, this is very consistent at the end of the day because we are putting ourselves in a situation where we have just a plane, uh, not a, a, a 3D or multi-dimensional quantity. And um, basically we see here that there is an analogy between uh, the uh, complex, um, and the, the um, imaginary unit J and uh, the uh, vector product uh, in um, um, uh, of vectors, okay? And uh, um, so we can have uh, the following result. We can define a multivector, which is a sort of a generalization of uh, complex numbers as rho plus omega, omega being possibly a vector of uh, any dimension, depending on the curve that we use and the dimension of this, the space that we consider. Uh, when we limit it to two dimensions, then we have the complex frequency. And uh, we can see that, uh, in fact, the, we, we can um, basically define the imaginary unit as uh, this uh, uh, direction along the binormal component, uh, which is basically the, the result of the vector product of the two uh, components, E1 and E2. Okay? Um, there is a literature on uh, the description of how the uh, complex plane uh, uh, is, uh, in fact, a, a stereographical projection of the 3D space at the end of the day. Okay, so uh, we have um, all the math, all the definitions, all the uh, main results, and uh, we can now move to some applications to make this useful to something, okay? Um, so in this second part, I will use the complex frequency in, um, uh, the equations of the power system and see how that can be uh, utilized. Um, okay, so I'm limiting to an analysis where I have um, um, basically only park vectors. Uh, there is no zero components, uh, no uh, negative sequences, no harmonics, 
Um, in this situation, uh, I can describe uh, the injections of the powers at every bus of the network as um, the um, uh, product um, of uh, the voltages and uh, the conjugate uh, of the currents at each uh, bus. Each element is um, de facto a function of time, even if they are complex quantities. Um, and then I can def uh, define uh, um, the currents uh, or approximate the currents for it's better uh, to say uh, as um, the product of the admittance matrix uh, by the voltage. Now, this is an, in fact an approximation because um, I'm neglecting the dynamics of the, the, the transmission lines. I'm saying um, whatever dynamics I have, I'm um, assuming that they're very fast. And so um, I'm considering that the system and the transmission system at least is um, always in stationary conditions. So I'm uh, only Mm, retaining the dynamics uh, of uh, the devices that are connecting to the buses if they are slow enough and of the controllers of these devices. Okay, um, so I can write as usual. Now it looks very like, very much like the powerful equations that everybody knows. Uh, the point is that the quantities are functions of time and uh, should be interpreted as uh, um, analytic signals really rather than uh, um, just phasors uh, or complex constant complex quantities. OK, um, there is still the dynamic of the system missing. And this can be described as usual, uh, taking into account um, differential algebraic equations. So here, I'm assuming that uh, Z is uh, uh, the vector of states, uh, and the Y the vector of algebraic variables. F are differential equations, so G are algebraic equations. This is the usual formulation that um, I, I, I think many of you have seen for uh, um, the transistability analysis of power systems. Um, implicitly in this formulation, uh, there is the fact that the network is stationary and uh, is assumed to be very fast. So an algebraic constraint for, the for, for, um, for, this, um, for this system. Um, now, why am I elaborating on this? Because um, at the end of the day, the voltage and the formulation of uh, the transistability model of the power system are uh, algebraic variables. Um, the um, complex power injections at the bus is uh, also algebraic power uh, variables in general. Um, so I would like to have an expression that links uh, algebraic variables to the states or the derivative of the states. And uh, this is possible uh, provided that um, this uh, Jacobian matrix uh, is full rank, but typically is unless we are exactly on top of some bifurcation, which is very unlikely to, to happen. So I say that this is generally possible to do. And um, so we have an expression that um, gives us the time derivatives of the algebraic variable as a, a function of the differential algebraic equation of the system and the states of the system. OK, in this way, we can say, uh, and we can always write an expression like that, again, except for special points that I'm, I'm not going to, to, to consider here. But we can say that the time derivative of the power injections it's a function of this um, um, time derivative of the voltages and the derivatives of the vector of states. Um, but uh, V prime is a quantity that we already seen and uh, is in fact a function of this complex frequency and uh, the voltage itself. So we are now very close to the expression that we want to find, which is a um, general uh, expression that links uh, uh, power or probably we're going to find the rate of change of power and uh, the frequency at every single bus of the network. Um, to do that, though, we had to make the frequency a complex quantity because just uh, um, uh, with one component, uh, we couldn't do that or we couldn't make the expression complete. OK, so we obtained, uh, uh, again, this result. That is one of the uh, most relevant results of analytic signals anyway. And um, um, yeah, let me just move a little bit faster here. So we can elaborate the equations to get to the final result. That is this red expression here um, that, as you see, links basically exclusively powers uh, or complex powers better. Um, the derivative of these complex powers, so the rate of change of power at the buses, and uh, the complex frequency. Now, this um, uppercase here, uh, S, is a matrix of the complex powers in every each line of the network. So at the end of here, we have exclusively 
an expression that um, links the topology of the system, the power injections and the rate of change, and the complex frequency at every bus of the system. Now, this is apparently a set of differential equations, uh, but it's not standalone. Um, we need to solve uh, the differential algebraic equation of the system, the ones that it depends on Z and the Y, and um, to be able to actually solve this one. But altogether, they form a set of consistent equations that have as many variables as uh, constraints. And so we can actually solve it and can find eta, regardless of the complexity of the devices that are uh, uh, given in the network. Now, another property of this equation is, um, uh, I think, um, uh, relevant, uh, which is that on the right hand side, there is uh, the topology of the system through this matrix S. And uh, on the left hand side, uh, there is the um, behavior of every each component that is connected to the grid. So this uh, S prime and S are in fact what um, depends on the states and uh, depends on the controllers that are connected to each bus on the, of the system. Um, OK, so elaborating a little bit more on these um, equations, um, we can find that uh, since they are complex uh, equations, we can find a, a way to split them into two parts. OK, uh, now um, I'm calling it S1 and S2. Uh, it, that's completely arbitrary. What I want to say is that there is a quota of this um, power injection, so that depends uh, on uh, the imaginary part of the frequency, which is what we tend to assimilate to the angular frequency or the instantaneous frequency of the voltage. And then uh, another quota that is a function of this radial frequency. And so mostly depending on the variation of the magnitude rather on, uh, than on the phase. These expressions uh, um, sum up the total rock up and the total rate of change of power and uh, are interesting because uh, they show that um, um, there is a link between, uh, uh, well, uh, two things. First, that um, um, the rate of change of power is always um, um, the result of the sum of two quantities, uh, one that depends on the variation of the angle and the, another one that depends on the variation of the magnitude of the voltage. Um, and this is, um, uh, this equality is also very satisfied. So um, depending on the behavior of the device, if it's a, a device that keeps constant the voltage, then uh, this uh, equality means that um, every uh, other, any variation has to be only because of the uh, phase angle and, and vice versa. So, um, we can uh, also simplify these expressions, and this is probably what is most uh, relevant. Uh, in the uh, first uh, approximation, we can say that uh, we have um, uh, P1 prime as a, a, a function only of omega. And uh, this first expression is at the end um, um, one expression that uh, um, I've been using in some other uh, work and they call the uh, frequency divider. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, some of you have, have uh, seen that uh, that work, uh, but that is in fact one special case of this most more, more general formulation. And then uh, um, uh, the other section can be simplified in this way. And um, so we see that um, in a, a reactive network, in a high, volt high voltage uh, uh, transmission systems are. Uh, typically more reactive than uh, resistive. So this second expression here, Q prime two, is a function of the variation of the, the, the magnitudes of the voltage. But uh, it's interesting to note that there is also a link of a, react a quarter of the reactive power and a quarter of the active power to respectively the uh, rate of change of the voltage and the rate of change of the phase angle. Um, provided that the system is resistive. So in uh, distribution systems or low voltage systems uh, where the resistances of the lines uh, tends to be more relevant than in high voltage transmission systems. Now, uh, this links here tends to be more important uh, and uh, uh, can be also utilized for control, for example, as uh, I'm going to show later in, a, in an example. So um, 
um, just to give some uh, visual um, illustration here, um, th this is a simulation of um, a benchmark IEEE uh, system. I, I think it was the uh, nine bus system here. I just want to show um, in general what is the relation, uh, the ratio, the um, typical values that a uh, raw and omega can take. Uh, omega, of course, here is just the variation with respect to omega zero, so is the deviation of the angular frequency with respect to the synchronous speed of the system. Um, but uh, typically, this is what happens. So rho tends to be much smaller in terms of uh, amplitude than omega. It tends, of course, to have a similar um, harmonics, similar oscillations, because every quantity of the system has, at the end, uh, to depend on the modes of the system, so th th they're going to slide similarly, but uh, typically raw as uh, an order of magnitude of um, amplitude lower than uh, the omega. Um, even so, it's not zero, and that's the point. Uh, uh, in some cases, we cannot neglect it, because if we do, uh, we, we make a, a, a major error. So uh, here I'm showing the comparison between um, the results that are obtained with the um, Okay, sorry, with a CF that is complex frequency here, PLLs that are the way, the usual way to estimate the um, frequency uh, locally at buses. And the third one would be the frequency divided, that is this approximation that considers only a quota of uh, the um, uh, active power and uh, um, only the angular frequency at the, at the buses. Um, and um, typically, the PLL and uh, the complex frequency do agree. Uh, actually, these plots should be interpreted in another way. We should assume that the complex frequency is actually right and uh, see how the others differ to it, and that the difference is how precise are or imprecise are the other quantities with respect to the complex frequency. Because as I uh, showed before, the complex frequency is obtained uh, without any approximation, really, except for uh, neglecting the dynamics of uh, the, the transmission grid. Um, we can have uh, some applications as well. Here, I'm um, sorry that is a little bit cryptic because I'm using some numbers that are, were not in the slides. But um, here, I want to show that it's possible using the complex frequency to estimate, for example, um, the coefficients of uh, voltage-dependent loads. Um, the gray line is um, a, a method that is provided in the literature, and um, the actual estimation, which is 2 here and 1.5, is much better um, obtained with uh, um, utilizing the, the equations that comes out from uh, the, the complex frequency theory. Uh, finally, I wanted to show um, an application of this um, relationship between the Q and omega, and um, uh, th that is uh, not necessarily uh, null uh, and negligible, um, especially if the grid has um, a stronger resistive component in the in the connections. So I'm going to compare um, two. Uh, sets of controllers. And the control one uh, is the classical control, where uh, I control the frequency through the active power in a, a distributed resource. And uh, I control the uh, voltage uh, through the reactive power injections of this um, uh, resource. Uh, this, the second uh, um, setup is uh, based on the complex frequency. Uh, so I'm using, um, yeah, probably here. Let me see. No, I, I made a, I, I just put again uh, the same um, uh, the same plot. But here it should be that I'm regulating omega through p and uh, omega also through uh, uh, q. Okay, so in this second plot it should be omega here and omega here as well. Okay, so of course there has to be some other device regulating the voltage, but uh, I can uh, dedicate some of the DERS to regulate the frequency through uh, the reactive power. And if I do that, then uh, um, we can obtain, uh, in fact, uh, you see the control two here um, as a better performance overall in the system. Um, 
there would be a lot to discuss here because of course the number of dirs that um, support the voltage and the number of dirs that support only the frequency matters so we need to to do things right but is it possible it is possible to um, uh, regulate uh, the frequency through the reactive power and uh, this is the main message here okay so i i hope that um um it was not to too many equations or too many definitions but uh, the point is that um one of the conclusions here is that um uh, differential geometry has a lot of potential to um be exploited especially the tools that it provides this uh, systematic way to uh, describe the behavior and the definition of invariance of um, uh, curves and uh, surfaces, uh, in fact, uh, can be useful for the analysis of power systems, provided that we find the right analogy and we don't, don't expect too much from it. So we need to be always uh, aware that um, uh, this um, invariance might not be the quantities that we want to find. Um, so we need to find the, the conditions for which the invariants are what we want. Um, then uh, uh, I've shown the definition of uh, a quantity that is the compressed frequency that um, um, is um, the, um, defined uh, assuming certain conditions, which are the, in fact the conditions that allows to have uh, an equivalency between uh, park vectors uh, and uh, analytic signals. And at that point, we have um, a consistent definition of the frequency in this way, and uh, also of um, uh, this uh, real part of the frequency, which is a sort of radial uh, frequency. Um, and um, um, yeah, um, with this quantity, we can uh, um, define the link between power injections and rate of power uh, of change of power injections at the buses and uh, the frequency in a detailed and uh, precise way that can allow to describe the behavior of the uh, devices uh, and uh, their impact on the on the grid and um, as a byproduct if we know how they impact we can uh, come out with uh, controllers that are um, um, maybe more efficient uh, uh, for uh, the support of uh, the dynamic performance performance of the net okay so here i think i just put some references and uh, i i'm done i hope it was not too long Thank you very much. Thank you, Federico, for uh, the great presentation. Diane, can we kill the 